Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A few introductions. I'm Pastor Schemann. I serve Redeemer Lutheran Church in St. Thomas and Grace Lutheran Church in West Lorne. And it's a pleasure for me to be here with you this Lenten tide and to uh, be able to serve you in this capacity. So a warm welcome to you and as you warmly and have so warmly welcomed me. I hope everyone here has a, a worship folder because we'll be following that. And so without uh, further ado, our opening hymn for this night is Jesus, I Will Ponder Now. reflection and in humble faith we bring before him our sins and sorrows our faults and failings I, I 
I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority. I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We continue now with the Passion reading. Please be seated. fifth part. The soldiers now had charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out of the city to a place called Skull Hill, in Hebrew, Golgotha. As they led him away, they laid hold of Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, who was coming in from the country. On him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Following him was a great company of people and of women who bewailed and lamented him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. The days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never gave suck. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things with a green tree, what will happen with a dry one? There were also two others, criminals, whom they led along to be put to death with him. When they came to the place called Golgotha, they gave him wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. It was the third hour, and there they crucified him. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The two criminals they also crucified with him, one on his right and the other on his left, with Jesus in the middle. The scripture was then fulfilled, which says, And, they were num and he was numbered with the transgressors. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they cast lots to divide his clothes, and decided what each should take. They made four parts, one for each soldier. There remained his tunic, which was without seam, woven in one piece from top to bottom. They said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide who shall have it. The scripture was thus fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. These things the soldiers did, and sitting down, they kept watch over them. Over his head was put the charge against him. Pilate wrote the notice to be put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This title was read by many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. The chief priests of the Jews then said to Pilate, You should not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. People stood by, watching. Those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests, with the scribes and elders, 
mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross, that we may see and believe. If he trusts in God, let God deliver him now, if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. <clears throat> the thieves who were crucified with him also reviled him. And one of the criminals who hung there with him railed at him. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? since you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are getting what we deserve for what we have done, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Near to the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli. Lama Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of them that were standing there heard it, they said, He is calling for Elijah. After this, Jesus knew that all things were accomplished. Fulfilling the scripture, he said, I thirst. There was a jar of wine standing there. One of them ran immediately to get a sponge. He filled it with wine, put it on a reed, held it up to his mouth, and gave him to drink. Others said, wait, and see if Elijah will come and save him. When Jesus had received the wine, <clears throat> he cried out with a loud voice, It is finished. Then he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion who stood facing him saw how he died, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. All the people who had gathered to see the sight, when they saw what had happened, turned away, beating their breasts. Those who had known him stood at a distance, as also the women who had followed him from Galilee. Among them was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and Jose and Salome, the mother of the sons of Zebedee. It was the day of preparation before the Sabbath, and this was Passover Sabbath. Therefore, so that the bodies should not remain on the crosses during the Sabbath, the Jews asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies removed. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other, who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. One who saw it is our witness, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, that you also may believe. These things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And another, scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. By this time, evening had come. A respected member of the council, Joseph of Arimathea, was one who was looking for the kingdom of God. 
a good and righteous man who had not consented to their purpose and deed. He was a disciple of Jesus secretly, for he feared the Jews. Now he took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was astonished that he could be dead already. He called for the centurion and asked him whether Jesus was already dead. When he was assured by the centurion that it was so, Pilate granted Joseph the corpse and commanded that it be given over to him. Joseph bought fine linen and came and took the body of Jesus. Nicodemus came also bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. It was he who had first come to Jesus by night. They then took the body of Jesus and wrapped it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb where no one had ever been buried. Joseph laid the body in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and departed. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jose were sitting there opposite the sepulcher and saw where he was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day they rested according to the commandment. On the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees went together to Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that impostor said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. Therefore, command that the sepulcher be made secure until the third day to stop his disciples from coming and stealing him and saying to the people, he has risen from the dead, making the final deception worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go and make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks Thank be to God. God. We continue now with the singing of Jesus, I will ponder now. taken from the 22nd chapter of the book Genesis. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from afar. 
Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come back again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Our second reading is taken from the fifth chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Romans. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel reading is taken from the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who was sent me to baptize, uh, he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne wit witness that this is the Son of God. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. We continue now with the singing of the hymn, Lamb of God, Pure and Holy.
and every one of you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We read in the scriptures, the Lamb of God, pure and holy. Or sorry, we sang, Lamb of God, pure and holy, all sins thou borest for us, else had despair reigned o'er us. We sang that three times. So just think of it, despair, anxiety, depression. Those are things we understand. There's a lot of that these days, and not just, not just here in the church, not just here in Canada, but, but the whole world, and rightfully so. And it's not just COVID, it's not just the price of gas or the price of houses or food. It's not just wars and rumors of wars global climate change, pollution, world population, and whatever other stories and events and catastrophes that you hear about on the evening news. I mean, it's all of that to be sure, but it's crisis upon crisis. From hurdle to the next hurdle, there's divisions amongst people, amongst our own families, in our own churches, divisions and anger and hate and you know what we're kind of grouchy we're grouchy we're tired and, and we're lonely and I don't like anybody and you know what nobody likes me either in a time when you know we should be pulling together we end up fighting even in the church we know a lot about living with despair and how hard and miserable it is See, Satan is having his way, and there's lots of sin. And you know, it's kind of a funny thing, though, that we don't seem to get all down and bothered with sin and have as much problem living with sin. Not worldly sin, that is the stuff way outside of us, just like I listed off, that makes us, us miserable, but but personal sin, individual sin, you and me, sinner kind of sin, you know, that moral stuff, 
greed and selfishness kind of stuff, slogging through a swamp of pride and self-indignation, to swim in, in a rising cesspool of sexual immorality and a sinking respect for life. And sadly, sadly, many Christians, you and me kind of Christians, have made their peace with that sin, thinking, well, why fight against what you cannot change, whether in the world or right in me? And so the message of many churches has changed. It's no longer Jesus who bled and died to remove sin, but Jesus as an example, Jesus as my mentor, Jesus as my life coach. Because we've grown comfortable with sin. We see it all around. We see it in our families. We see it in ourselves. And, oh, we dare not ever speak about it because somebody would be offended. Our own children and grandchildren wouldn't even come and visit us if they thought that we thought those things were maybe a little sinful. Well, what kind of a preacher would I be if I didn't talk about sin a lot? Our sin, my sin, especially during this season of Lent. The season of Lent sets us straight. It's about repentance, that the solution to despair is not to ignore or to make peace with the sin that causes it, but to look right to our Savior, who didn't come to help us live with sin or to just cover it up under the guise of happiness, but to do away with sin, both that our sin be forgiven and that we live no longer in sin, but in holiness. And to do that, look towards Good Friday. We heard all about that Good Friday in the Passion reading. It took the miserable, horrible death of the cross. And on that Good Friday, and all day Saturday, and most of the day Sunday, without a Savior, the disciples were in despair. Their friend was gone. Their hopes were dashed. And they thought that they were next. But hidden under that defeat, as you know, as I know, was victory. They didn't know it, but we do because we read back into, it, into the scripture, knowing what comes after before it's read. And hidden under that crushing death was the answer to our despair, for our time, in our life. For the one who died on the cross that day was not only the man Jesus, and not only the very Son of God, but as John the baptizer proclaimed, and as we have been singing all through this Lenten season, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God provided to give us hope and a future. Even in our day, hope and a future, which are the, the very two things that seem to be in short supply for Abraham and Isaac. Hope and a future. For Isaac was Abraham's future and the future of God's promise. Because the promise was promised to Abraham and through his descendants. And so here is the future, right there, incarnate in Isaac. And when God told Abraham to sacrifice his son, his only son, the one he loved, to not only plunge a knife into him and end his life, but then to cremate his body as a burnt offering, it seemed as if all hope was gone as well. How can we possibly know what was going on in Abraham's head when he heard those chilling and difficult words from the Lord God? And also when he heard those chilling and difficult words right from his own son, Father, 
Where is the Lamb? And just as we wonder about the things that go on in the world and in our own lives, no doubt Abraham wondered too. Wondered about God's plan. Giving and then taking away. Was God for him or against him? It can seem that way for us too in our lives. God has given us so many great and precious promises. And yet, what if they don't play out? in our lives the way that we think that they should play out when sadness and, sto and sorrow strike us when the trials and troubles of life overwhelm us when doing what god has told us to do only seems to hurt and not to help and in fact may seem like the very opposite of what makes all earthly sense is god for us or against us where is God in war and COVID and cancer and accident and violence and addiction and suffering and death? Where is this Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? What about my sin? God did not give Abraham and Isaac an easy out or a quick answer. Only after the wood was arranged and the boy bound and placed right there on the altar, and the knife poised to kill, and Abraham's muscles taut and ready to go, did God intervene. And then he provided the lamb. And so Abraham gave that place a new name, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. Of course, we know we now know, that is, since we're 2,000 years after Jesus, about as long as Abraham was before Jesus, that what Abraham went through was a foreshadowing, a looking forward, like a dress rehearsal for the real thing. When on the mountain of the Lord, named Calvary, the Father did offer up his son, his only son, his beloved son, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world to set you and me free, us free, free from sin, free from despair, free from eternal death. And so the Lord provided for us. And not just food and drink, clothing and shoes, house and home, wife and children, and all the things that we talk about in the, the, the first article of the creed, all that stuff, all that worldly stuff and life that you and I both need. But more than that, he saved your neck. He saved your neck. For in truth, you are Isaac, the one bound in sin. You are Isaac, the one under the sentence of death. You are the one who is only one stroke away from eternal condemnation and a never-ending cremation in the fires of hell. But for you, God has provided the lamb for the burnt offering. For you, God intervened and gave his son right there in your place. That is the good news that St. Paul wrote about to the Christians in Rome. That while we were still sinners, while we were bound in sin on the altar of death, Christ died for us in our place and saved us from the wrath of God or in other words he took our place and set you free that's the message to proclaim to the world to all asking where is the lamb where is hope in all the things that go on in the world right now troubling things difficult things and where can we find a future what kind of a future will we even have? And what will it be like? For we know, we know, here is the Lamb. We know that today, the resurrected Jesus comes now to us in his word and sacrament to release and to rescue sin-ravaged hearts and lives. Here is comfort, right here, in these words, at this altar, in this place, even at this time, here is comfort for our fears, rest from our messed up, miserable lives, 
respite for our souls and solace in despair. Here we see that, like Abraham of old, what seems to be from our little narrow viewpoint isn't necessarily at all the way things that the way things are really. And that even if God brings us to the very brink, he will not let us fall. For that night didn't fall upon Isaac. It fell upon the Lord Jesus, our substitute. It didn't fall upon us either. So now for us, in spite of what Satan and the world and our, and our own sinful flesh want to throw at us, there is not despair, but hope and a future. Jesus cleanses us from the filth that has polluted us in body, mind, and soul. He frees us from the sin that we ourselves have done and from the fallout of the sins that others have done around us and to us. For he bore our sin away, far away as the east is from the west, which, which means they're never coming back to haunt us, ever. You are forgiven. You are a child of God. You are Isaac, who is bound and set free to now live, not in despair, but in faith. Not in fear, but in hope, real hope. And not in sin, but in holiness and righteousness that we have through Christ our Savior. And to do so both now and forever. Thanks be to Jesus. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We continue now with the hymn, On My Heart, Imprint Your Image. Spare us, good Lord. Be gracious to us. Help us, good Lord. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, Help us, good Lord. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death and in the day of judgment. Help us, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, O Lord. To prosper the preaching of your word, to bless our prayer and meditation, 
to strengthen and preserve us in the true faith, and to give heart to our sorrow and strength to our repentance. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. To draw all to yourself, to bless those who are instructed in the faith, to watch over and console the poor, the sick, the distressed, the lonely, the forsaken, the abandoned, and all who stand in need of our prayers, to give abundant blessing to all works of mercy, and to have mercy on us all. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. To turn our hearts to you, to turn the hearts of our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and graciously to hear our prayers. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people, that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Our closing hymn is, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. <laughs>